Radio has rarely been without a Green Day hit since the mid-90s, and if you want to know more about the band's story, from their punk origins to their tragic losses, then check out this look into the life and times of Green Day. Green Day has had the same three members since 1991, a remarkably long run in the fickle world of rock and roll. Billy Joe Armstrong and Mike Durnt have been around since the band's inception in 1986, with Trey Cool signing on five years later, providing the final piece of the musical puzzle. In the mid-80s, when Armstrong and Durnt were teenagers, they teamed up with a couple of friends to form their first band. Initially, they were a metal band called Condom, then they changed their name to Desecrated Youth when the group started playing more straight-ahead rock. By 1986, the band started to develop the Green Day sound that everybody knows and loves, but they started out going by the name of Sweet Children. The band's original drummer was long gone, and when Sweet Children played its first show in 1988, it was with John Kiffmeyer behind the drum kit. After he decided to attend college full-time in 1990, the band, now called Green Day, had to find a new drummer, and they found a pretty cool one. Since the very beginning, part of punk rock's unrelenting ethic to rebel against anything conventional has been for the musicians to adopt stage names. The funnier, brattier, and more threatening, the better. There are plenty of examples. Take 70s punk band Germs, home to musicians Darby Crash and Pat Smear. And of course, there's the Sex Pistols, with their infamous frontman Johnny Rotten and Sid Vicious on bass. Green Day followed suit with this tradition, for the most part. The band's bassist was born with the name Michael Pritchard, but he plays under the moniker Mike Durnt. When he was in elementary school, the future musician liked to play air bass, and while doing so, he would imitate the sound of the instrument by making a Durnt sound with his mouth. Thus, he became Mike Durnt. As for the drummer Trey Cool, in the mid-1980s, at the age of 12, he joined Larry Livermore's band The Lookouts. At the time, he was just a kid named Frank Edwin Wright III. Half the age of his bandmates, Wright struggled to fit in, and Livermore gave him the iconic name Trey Cool. Only frontman Billy Joe Armstrong decided to stick with the name his parents gave him, and Billy Joe is definitely not short for a more regal moniker. My mom listened to a lot of country music, you know, she comes from Oklahoma, hence yeah. the name Billy Joe. On February 9, 2011, seemingly out of the blue, Billy Joe Armstrong revealed on Twitter the inspiration for three of the band's best-known songs. According to his tweet, she, Sassafras Roots, and What's-Her-Name are all about a girl named Amanda. According to Alan DePerna's Green Day, The Ultimate Unauthorized History, she's also the subject of She's a Rebel and the devastating breakup song Good Riddance, Time of Your Life. So who exactly is this Amanda person? Well, in 1991, after returning home from a club tour, Armstrong broke up with his girlfriend and met up with a woman named Amanda, a punk rock feminist he knew from the Berkeley scene. The relationship didn't last long, and according to Mark Spitz's Nobody Likes You Inside the Turbulent Life, Times, and Music of Green Day, Amanda dumped Armstrong right around the time the group's debut album turned him into an international superstar in 1994. Armstrong was devastated by the breakup, and he came up with good riddance in response. He wound up holding on to it for almost four years, eventually including it on the 1997 album Nimrod. While Armstrong ultimately married and has a family with someone else, he couldn't quite move on from Amanda. She not only influenced the song What's Her Name, but also the character of the same name in the band's concept album American Idiot. The frightening events of Woodstock 99, primarily a destructive and fiery riot prompted by price-gouging water vendors and an inciting Limp Biscuit performance, have left the events of Woodstock 94 almost completely forgotten. The three-day festival held in upstate New York was originally meant to pay homage to the 1969 Woodstock concert on its 25th anniversary. However, times had definitely changed, and the original festival's vibes of peace and love didn't quite mesh with the lineup of contemporary artists featured at Woodstock 94, which included Headbangers Metallica, Trent Reznor's Nine Inch Nails, and relative newcomers Green Day. The punk trio, one of the most popular emerging acts of the year, took the stage on day three. By that time, audience members were anxious, exhausted, and tired of getting rained on, and Green Day didn't really help matters with their stage banter. They jokingly referred to the audience as funny little people and rich mother Then, in the middle of the show, bassist Mike Durnt literally asked for trouble and mud. Yeah, we suggest that you throw mud. That's fun. <laughs> the band was soon eating its words when the crowd started throwing chunks of mud at the stage. About two-thirds of the way through their 35-minute slot, the set had descended into a thick two-way mud fight between Billy Joe Armstrong and the crowd. Durnt added even more fuel to the fire with another round of tongue-in-cheek comments to the audience. You're just mad because you're in the rain. Well, f*** you. I hope it rains so much you all get stuck. However, instant karma hit Durnt hard. After the set, when he tried to run across the stage, the mud-covered bassist was tackled by a security guard knocking out part of his tooth. 
In 2000, Green Day released its album Warning, with the title track as the second single. Not as breakneck and punkish as its earlier work, Warning was a bouncy song built around a circular riff. Perhaps music buyers found the single so irresistible because it sounded pleasantly familiar. As pointed out by Pop Matters and other outlets, Warning sounds a whole lot like the song Picture Book by The Kinks. The tune was a standout track from the influential British group's album The Kinks Are the Village Green Preservation Society. Ray Davies, the band's frontman and writer of Picture Book, likely would have had a strong case if he'd pursued a copyright infringement lawsuit, but he didn't. Oddly, Green Day got hit with a lawsuit over Warning by a little-known band from England called Other Garden. It was reported that the band's leader Colin Mary wrote a song called Never Got the Chance in 1992. Citing a keen similarity between that song and Warning, Mary alleged that Green Day ripped him off and asked their publisher Warner Chappelle to freeze royalties generated by Warning. While Mary acknowledged the similarity between the Kinks' song Picture Book and Warning, he thought the Green Day tune sounded far more like his. Perhaps not wanting to get the attention of the Kinks and put an infringement target on his own back, Mary later dropped the suit. In 2003, Green Day was nearly finished with recording what was to be its seventh studio album, Cigarettes and Valentines. But even hardcore Green Day completists haven't heard the entirety of the record. That's because while the band was working on it and nearing its completion, the master tapes were stolen. The idea of redoing all that work was just too much to bear and not that attractive of an idea. So Green Day canceled the album entirely in favor of working on a brand new record, which turned out to be the mega-hit American Idiot. Eventually, the master tapes were recovered, but Green Day has yet to release those recordings in their original forms. Billy Joe Armstrong told NME that they still have the tapes in the band's vault, but those tracks might never see the light of day. Bassist Mike Durnt elaborated, There's always a lot in the vault, but we tend to look forward rather than, you know, reaching back. However, a few of those lost songs were eventually released for public consumption. For example, a live version of the title track appears on Green Day's live album, Awesome as <laughs> Another tune that escaped the vault is Youngblood. Armstrong said that the song got a facelift and new lyrics before it was included on the band's 2016 LP Revolution Radio. Around the time that Green Day abandoned the album Cigarettes and Valentines and then made American Idiot, the trio took a serious left turn and formed a new wave sideband called The Network. Green Day and Associates performed in masks and adopted stage names like Fink, Van Gogh, The Snoo, and Z. They even released an album called Money Money 2020. According to NME, there was speculation that the record was actually Cigarettes and Valentine's renamed, a charge Armstrong denied. Green Day also cheekily denied being the network at all, at least at first, but nobody involved with the project held the secret that closely. The network's vocals and instrumentation sounded a lot like Green Day, and the song's registered writers were Armstrong and company. It was all in good fun, especially when the network released footage of a press conference in which the band members went crazy when the words Green Day were uttered aloud. As part of the made-up just-for-fun lore, the network hated Green Day and considered the band its sworn enemy. Nevertheless, the two not-at-all separate parties patched things up enough for the network to open for Green Day at a Las Vegas show in 2005. It wasn't until a decade later in an interview with Rolling Stone in 2013 that somebody fessed up. Mike Durnt made a casual reference to the band's busy early 2000s, which included the network record. At the time that it was released, Wake Me Up When September Ends was an outlier several times over. It's a tender, emotionally wrenching ballad performed by Green Day, a band generally known for speeding through pop-punk tunes. While it appears on the group's 2004 thematic song cycle American Idiot, it has nothing to do with the plot or characters found elsewhere on the album. It's also the Green Day song closest to singer and songwriter Billy Joe Armstrong's heart. At a taping of VH1 Storytellers in 2005, Armstrong said, It's a personal thing. I've never tackled an issue about that, about singing about my father. It's hard to sing, but definitely therapeutic, because it deals with the passing of someone that you love. Armstrong's dad, a jazz drummer who helped him get into music, died in 1982 when the Green Day frontman was only 10 years old. Many years after the song was written, it's still a tough one for Armstrong to get through, and as such, Green Day doesn't play it live all that often. The band did, however, perform it on a 2019 visit to The Howard Stern Show. Armstrong even talked a bit more about the song and his father. Do you still actively think about your father when you sing this? Um, yeah, I mean, I think about him every day. Really? really? It might seem incongruous that somebody would take American Idiot, an album by a famous rock band, and adapt it into a big Broadway musical full of singing and dancing. But it's actually not all that weird. In 2010, American Idiot, the musical, debuted at the St. James Theater on Great White Way. Frontman Billy Joe Armstrong told the New York Times that theatrical forms were in his mind when the band crafted American Idiot in the early 2000s. He went on to say, 
Storytelling has always been at the heart of much of my music. We talked about doing a mini opera, and each of us wrote 30-second songs about exactly where we were in our lives, and we started seeing this arc of a story that we felt we wanted to tell. These songs developed into a concept album that told the story of Jesus of Suburbia and St. Jimmy, among other characters. But playwright and theatrical director Michael Mayer, who won a Tony for helming the rock musical Spring Awakening in 2007, thought American Idiot told a bigger story about youth alienated by leaders and the media. He already had a rough outline of a show, with new characters and a clear storyline put together before he even approached Armstrong. Together, they wrote the script for the show, and Armstrong occasionally acted in the Broadway production, playing the character St. Jimmy. In recent years, there's even been talk of a film version of American Idiot. With so much success over the past three decades, Green Day must have friends in pretty high places. God's favorite band, Green Day! Check out one of our newest videos right here. Plus, even more grunge videos about your favorite bands are coming soon. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell so you don't miss a single one.